Well, hello, everyone. This is June Edwards for Creative um, Senior Topics. And this is one of my favorite weeks of the year leading up to the 4th of July. I've got on my, my shirt here with all my sparkly decorations on it. I don't know how well you can actually see that. But anyway, I'm excited about the fireworks coming and the fact that we're outside again. And I'm sure you're excited too. It's something to really look forward to every year. And in just a few years, we're gonna be up to our 250th anniversary of the country. I think that's in 220, uh, uh, 2026, if I'm correct on that. And that's gonna be a great celebration too. But for now, let's go ahead and look at our calendar. We are ending the month of June and then going into the first four days of July. So on the 28th of June was Paul Bunyan Folktale Day. Paul Bunyan was a giant of a man with a giant ox named Babe that was a royal blue like my shirt. <clears throat> he lived in Minnesota. And there's lots and lots of tall tales about him. June 29th. Can you believe that 2007 was the first time the iPhone, the iPhone was released? What would we do without our phones now? I use it for timing my programs. I use it for telephone calls, of course. I use it to take pictures. And I use it to look things up on the internet and to check the weather. I mean, there's so many things that we use our phones for. It's also known June 29th as camera day. June 30th is meteor day or asteroid day. It is Superman's birthday. He was invented in 1938 in the comics and quickly made it into the movies and a television show. It is also the day that the National Organization of Women was organized or founded in 1966 to work for better pay and better working conditions for women. Now moving into the month of July, July 1st is Canada Day. It is International Joke Day. And I'm sure you can think of a few good jokes. And if I'm there in person this fall, I'll have a lot of good seasonal jokes for you. It is National Postal Worker Day for male men and male women, the U.S. Postal Service. And in 1961, Princess Diana from the United Kingdom was born. July 2nd. The first Walmart opened up in 1962 in Rogers, Arkansas. 1900 was the first Zeppelin hot air balloon flight. And on the 3rd of July is on what they call the dog days. The dog days of summer, which are the really hot days where people feel listless, they just don't want to do anything. They just kind of want to lay around like their dog. And uh, it gets very hot, very humid in some parts of the country, very dry in other parts of the country. And it's the dog days until the middle of August. Of course, July 4th is our Independence Day. It is also National Country Music Day. And the Tom Sawyer novel, uh, the story about the fence painting incident. So they celebrate Tom Sawyer Fence Painting Day on the 4th of July in between all the fireworks, the barbecues. And I don't know if there's gonna be any parades anywhere, probably in some parts of the country. So we have a full list of events to look forward to and to celebrate. There's always something, isn't there? It's just our attitude. We have to change our attitudes and be happy about the many blessings that we have. 
Well, now I want to share something that I found that was really odd. Did you know that there is a, uh, well, it's a cemetery now. It's a remote location in rural America where there is a unique gathering of the United States presidents, row after row of presidential head statues or busts. They have 43 gigantic busts. And I want to show you a picture of what it looks like. Look at this. Isn't that amazing? Look at all of them. Now, Abraham Lincoln's statue has a large hole in the back of his head. Ronald Reagan has a lightning-shaped scar. George Washington's face is crumbling off. And all of them, in addition to the other 40 U.S. presidents, are sitting in a desolate field in Croker, Virginia, which serves as a graveyard of sorts for abandoned presidential statues. The giant busts, which stand about 20 feet tall, were originally part of President's Park, a sculpture park and museum in Williamsburg, Virginia, but it closed in 2010. And today the eerie presidents created by artist David Adix await their future on concrete businessman Howard Hankins 400 acre farm. The bus are no longer available for public viewing. So let me just have you look at them. A few photographers are granted access occasionally, but the statues are being exposed to the weather elements and it has brought weather beaten character to their faces. Let me show you this picture once more. It's just not that one, but this one. It's an eerie, eerie picture of these statues. I hope that somebody will rescue them and set up a park where they can be repaired and given the honor they deserve. Now, speaking of presidential honors, uh, America's presidential libraries are a treasure house of history from election memorabilia to drafts of first speeches such as Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Day of Infamy speech after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941 and many, many more interesting things. And I want to tell you just a couple things about the different, this is the picture. I got this out of Parade Magazine, oh, quite a few years ago, but I think it's an interesting story. We celebrate um, some of these today. Let, let's talk about the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum in Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, Michigan. There is a staircase that leads to the helipad on top of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon when the city fell to the North Vietnamese in April of 1975. Six or 7,000 people went up that staircase to catch a ride on an American helicopter and get out to freedom. You also can see Ford's Eagle Scout sash. He was the only president to make the rank of Eagle Scout. He was born with the name Leslie Lynch King Jr., but was adopted by his mother's second husband, Gerald R. Ford Sr. The burglar's tools used to break into the offices of the Democratic National Democrat National Committee in the Watergate building in 1972, which led to President Nixon's resignation and Vice President Ford becoming president, can also be seen in the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. What about the FDR Presidential Library and Museum? That one is located in Hyde Park, New York. There is a seven foot tall paper mache Roosevelt Sphinx head that was given to him by journalists at the 1939 Gridiron Press Dinner. 
He was often called a sphinx in the press because they did not know what he was going to do next. FDR collected stamps, books, and more than 400 model ships, including a model of the USS Constitution battleship that he kept throughout his presidency. What's relevant today, there are documents that show that during World War II, Roosevelt was struggling with how to handle refugees. Many thought the refugees could pose a national security threat. There is also an original draft of FDR's Day of Infamy speech. Just hours after FDR heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he leaned back in his chair, took a long drag on a cigarette, and dictated the seven-minute speech nonstop. Wow. How about the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum in Dallas, Texas? In that one, there is a 22-foot-tall twisted charred steel beam from the World Trade Center, Trade Center in New York City. There is a permanent exhibit dedicated to the election of 2000 in which close voting tallies led to a recount of votes in Florida and a decision by the US Supreme Court to halt further recounts. There is a Howard badge Arlene Howard's son, George, an off-duty Port Authority police officer, rushed to the World Trade Center when the planes hit on September 11th, 2001, and he was killed when the towers fell. His mother gave his badge to President Bush, who carried it with him every day, and he only gave it to the presidential library at the very last second as they were setting things up. How about the George H. W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum in College Station, Texas? This was his, uh, the President W. Bush's father. A 12 foot high section of the Berlin Wall is there, which fell and was pulled down by people who wanted to reunite all of Germany. And that happened in November, 1989. You will be surprised when you see the Avenger aircraft that's the same model of the real one that Bush flew during World War II. Bush was the youngest pilot in the Navy when he received his wings. He was 20 years old when his plane was shot down during a bombing run in the Pacific. As a U.S. congressman in the 1960s, Bush had to make some tough decisions. He voted for the fair housing provision of the Civil Rights Bill, which his constituents were not in favor of. Sometimes politicians have to make decisions that are not always best for their career, but they are the right thing to do. There are two personal letters there worthy of note. One that Bush wrote to his children on the eve of the Gulf War about the difficulty of making the decision to send other people's children into war. The second is a heartfelt letter to his mother a few years after his four-year-old daughter, Robin, died of leukemia in 1953. And there's one more I want to talk about today out of the 13 presidential libraries, which are run by our National Park Service. This one is the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library and Museum located in Austin, Texas. Don't miss the small Roman Catholic Missal upon which LBJ swore the oath of office aboard Air Force One on November 22nd, 1963, following President Kennedy's assassination. 
that missile. And that's M-I-S-S-A-L. It's like a memento belonged to John Fitzgerald Kennedy while he was alive. There are so many pens, 72 pens that LBJ used to sign the Civil Rights Act into law in 1964. The director of his museum, Mark Updegrove said, what's instructive when you come here is seeing how harmonious the relations were between Democrats and Republicans. LBJ had the benefit of a productive working relationship with most members of Congress, which contrasts dramatically with Washington DC's Congress today. The crown jewel of the archive is the taped telephone recordings of LBJ doing the business of his presidency. You can pick up a handset and hear LBJ talking to Martin Luther King Jr. about civil rights or to Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara about the Vietnam War. And I have here um, a pamphlet from one of the local ones located in California, the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. When you go through this library, he said at the opening in 1990, I hope you will remember that while the past is interesting, it is important only as it points the way to a better future. And the location of the Nixon family small citrus farm is on the site, which is in Northern Orange County, less than an hour from downtown Los Angeles and only minutes of Anaheim in Yorba Linda. The tour of the campus includes Richard Nixon's birthplace and boyhood home the Marine One helicopter used by several presidents, replicas of the Oval Office in the White House East Room, and the final resting places were President and Mrs. Nixon. I wish that I had, uh, here's a map of what it looks like too. What I'm gonna have to do is go back to the Ronald Reagan Library, which is, uh, in Northern Los Angeles County. And then maybe I can add that to our talks about presidential libraries in the future. Okay, I want to go on and we're gonna talk about the 4th of July and the American War. <clears throat> I have an article, a story written by one of my creative writing seniors from that class called The American Way. Howard Childers was a pilot during World War II stationed in the Pacific battlefront. Here's what he says. Why am I glad to be American? The answer can be complex and extensive, but after considerable thought can be all included in one word, liberty. We are free to act, to travel, to learn and speak as we want or wish, but what price must we pay for that freedom? We each owe a duty and obligation to attempt to conduct ourselves in both thought and action without injury to others. Our forefathers and subsequent leaders have defined limits of decorum by adopting many laws and rules governing our moral and ethical behavior guided by our constitution and the Bill of Rights. Most of us try to keep our social, professional, and daily living activities within those limits. But human nature being what it is, there are always divisions between good guys and bad guys. The bad guys are those who disregard the rights of others and do harm as if the rules don't apply to them. Most of us do try to follow the rules, 
because we have learned that reasonable regulation simplifies and improves our life experiences. Until there was some regulation placed on their lives, early settlers found little pleasure in American life other than hard-won food on the table and protection from storms and predators. Now we are surrounded with plentiful necessities, safety, and comfort. Sure, this makes it nice to live in America as compared to many other parts of the world, but this is not the real reason why I'm glad to be an American. Through the years, we have developed a fundamentally sound system of governing for a practical and productive free society. Dependent upon laws and rules to encourage good guys and turn back or penalize bad guys, America exemplifies the concepts of liberty and freedom. This is truly the reason why I am glad to be an American. Thank you, Howard. Now, our country has been so blessed. Chuck Norris, remember Chuck Norris, the movie star and the rifle man and many other shows and movies? He had a blog back around 2011 and he wrote about a book that he had read called Tempting Points That Save the World, American Freedom, Seven Miracles, written by Chris and Ted Stewart. Seven Miracles That Saved America. And I wanted to read to you what he lists as some of those freedoms. Okay, first of all, Christopher Columbus, who kept going and sailing into the unknown, even doctoring up his maps so that his sailors wouldn't be too afraid and mutiny against him as they went further and further to the unknown west and discovered a whole continent that led to North, Central, and South America. Number two, the epic survival of the first English colonists at Jamestown, despite the onslaught of starvation, the harsh, harsh winter, hostile Indians, and yet there were friendly Indians who taught them how to grow the foods that would grow in the harsh uh, New England weather. Number three, General George Washington and the Continental Army's Battle of New York, which turned the tide of the Revolutionary War so that this small upstart Continental Con uh, Army could defeat the greatest empire in the world at that time, the British Empire. Number four, the astounding conception by men of genius minds and the formation of the United States Constitution, the longest surviving document of democracy ever to exist. And like I said before, in 2026 will be the 250th anniversary of the founding of the country. Next one, Abraham Lincoln's plea with the almighty God that turned the tide of the civil war at Kettysburg and put our country back together and kept enemies from further division of it. Another one is the astonishing events that altered the course of the Battle of Midway in June 1942 during World War II. And number seven, the extension of freedom around the world because Ronald Reagan's life and presidency were spared miraculously after an assassination attempt on him when he was US president. It also led to the 
tearing down of the Berlin Wall in the early 1980s and the breakup of the Soviet Union empire and the um, ending of the Cold War for the next 30 years. You know, these crucial events were not only coincidental, but providential. Has God repeatedly intervened in the affairs of men and preserved the United States of America? Millions of Americans would say, no doubt, America, as the song says, God has shed his grace upon thee. And Benjamin Franklin said, uh, he addressed those who attended the Constitutional Convention to form the U.S. Constitution. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this very room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. To that kind providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national happiness. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Oh no, we must never forget him. Do we imagine we no longer need God's assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? And of course, I can think of other miracles like the crossing of the Delaware around midnight. Christmas Eve by George Washington and his men that led to the Battle of Trent, where they were able to overcome sleeping Germans who had been hired, Hessians who'd been hired by the British to fight. And other beautiful pictures that I want to show you. The Battle of New Orleans. In 1815, this critical battle came two weeks after the Treaty of Ghent ending the War of 1812, when Britain again attacked the United States and tried to keep us from having our new nation. And yet, Andrew Jackson, bold victory over the British, cemented his enormous popularity as a citizen soldier. And Frederick Douglass appealing to President Lincoln and his cabinet to enlist blacks or Negroes as they were called then. He wanted abolition and he wanted the African Americans to be free. And Frederick Douglass was an amazing influence on Abraham Lincoln, who later had the June 19th emancipation of the slaves, freeing them. And then there's other ones. This is the USS Constitution, forcing the surrender of Her Majesty's Guerrero off the coast of Nova Scotia on August 19, 1812, in an early part of the 1812 war. And it raised the spirits of American citizens and soldiers so that we could fight against the British in the Second War, where we had to keep our independence. And there's other ones here. Here's the late battle at Charleston, June 17, 1775. Conflicts between colonists and British troops at Lexington and Concord. But the Battle of Bunker Hill two months later was the first deliberate battle. 
of the American Revolution. We did not have cameras in those days, but we had painters and artists who could sketch exactly what was going on. Of course, the Battle of Bunker Hill, this is a Courier and Ives print that came out in the 1800s. Many people were still alive when this print came out and could testify to whether it was accurate or not. So many wonderful things. The illustrious patriots of 1776 and authors of the Declaration of Independence the great American historian Samuel Eliot Morrison wrote, if the American Revolution had produced nothing but the Declaration of Independence, it would have been worthwhile. You know, it actually was completed July 2. So why don't we celebrate on July 2 instead of July 4th? They had to wait for some of the delegates to travel and travel was slow in those days. And the last signature was not on it until July 4th. So that is why they did that, that they, they signed the constitution and uh, Here's another picture, the signing of the Constitution. It was painted in 1940, 80 years ago. Such beautiful artwork, isn't it? I'm so glad that I can show it to you. And then I have this calendar, which was put out by a, um, a good group, the Judicial Watch. Frederick Kemmelmeyer painted around 1795. Washington reviewing the Western Army at Fort Cumberland, Maryland, during what was called the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. It was one of the first tests of the powers of the new federal government. So great was popular respect for the first president, George Washington, that when he mobilized troops to suppress the rebellion in October, 1794, Resistance fizzled. George Washington was another miracle man. Several times he had horses shot out from under him in the heat of battle. One time before any of that even happened when he was still a surveyor and he was a scout fighting during the French Indian War when he was in the British Army before uh, many, many years previous, he knelt down to get a drink of water from a creek. He turned his head like this, an Indian arrow whizzed by him where his head had been and missed him just by inches. So George Washington was really protected. And then George Washington to Valley Forge with his troops. This painting is by E. Percy Moran in 1911. On December 19, 1777, General Washington bivouacked his exhausted troops at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania for the winter of 1770. The previous fall campaign had been so demanding that at the time it was estimated that 4,000 of Washington's 12,000 troops were unfit for duty. And yet so many re-enlisted and stayed, even when they had no boots and they had to cover their freezing feet with rags. And who came out to encourage them all the time? Martha Washington. So many wonderful ones. Well, I think I've probably gone over my time just a little bit. I want to wish you and your friends and family a happy 4th of July. Never forget the cost at which we keep our freedom and never let us ever lose our country.
Bye, everybody.